Santa's making his list about now, checking it twice, finding out who's naughty or nice. Sad to say those lists are already being compiled, not by Mr Claus Esquire, but by those in assumed positions of power. A glance across the water at Ireland makes plain the putting together of the naughty list is well underway. Legislation hustled through Parliament there in the aftermath of riots after the stabbing of children and their teacher outside their school. Gifts authorities astonishing new powers of surveillance of the Irish people with a view to seeing who's naughty or nice. But the genesis of the theft of freedom predates any recent unrest. Back in 2022, politician Pauline O'Reilly talked openly about how she and her colleagues were working to shorten the leash. Quote, that's exactly what we are doing here, she said. We are restricting freedom, but we're doing it for the common good. The common good. Fear the common good like no other state cover for theft of your rights. Santa sees you when you're sleeping. He knows when you're awake. He knows when you've been bad or good, so be good for goodness sake. Santa's surveillance is the least of it. More and more, it's clear an unholy alliance of governments, banks, big tech and intelligence agencies is making a reality of round-the-clock surveillance of citizens. They'll know what you've been reading. They'll know all that you've said. They'll decide if you've been bad or good. And they'll put the mockers on your bank account and generally make your life unlivable or throw you in jail if you put a two out of line. In another life, what feels like a hundred years ago, I was part of a team at British Telecom taking care of content on the company's website. Back in the mid-1990s, it was only the third website to exist in Britain. I found the internet even more confusing then than I do now. And among a slew of questions I had was how and why everything was free. Free software, free access, millions of pages of information about anything and everything. I couldn't work out why something so amazing was free to all comers. Qui bono, you might say. More recently, I realised it was all about baiting a trap, all that convenience. So much for nothing in return for just handing over more and more personal data to persons unknown. And here we are, flies stuck on one big web with spiders that know more about us than we know about ourselves. Genius, really, but then it was the idea of the US military. For the longest time, the internet was a place of anonymity. No names, no pack drills. Now that anonymity has been identified by the powers that be as the final obstacle standing in the way of total control. Which reminds me of something else I learned at BT. In the early days of the telephone in the US, an undertaker called Almond Brown Strouger was convinced he was losing business to a rival undertaker whose wife was the operator at the local telephone exchange. Whenever anyone called looking for an undertaker, she always connected them to her husband's business. And so Strouger invented an automatic exchange that took human operators out of the loop. Now the connections were made by an unthinking machine and no human could watch or interfere. Now, 140 odd years later, it seems to me the authorities would prefer they could step in again, see who's talking to who, what they're saying, whether it's right think or wrong think. The new legislation in Ireland gives the state unprecedented power to pry into what people are reading, writing and saying online. If a policeman wants to see what an Irish man or woman has been looking at online, reading online, he can demand access to mobile phones, computers, tablets, whatever. For that kit is protected by a pin, the policeman is empowered to demand it. Failure to comply could lead to prosecution and a year in jail. Stop and think about that. No more privacy and flunkies of the state deciding in advance of any evidence of wrongdoing whether you or I are likely suspects. A judge decides if you seem likely to circulate a document, a meme, a link, and so makes a judgment about whether a hate crime might be committed in the future. Here we have nothing less than the advent of thought crime, or even pre-crime as it was imagined in the sci-fi movie Minority Report. Santa checks if you've been bad in the past. Now we face a future where myrmidons of the state can decide arbitrarily if you might be bad in the future. In Ireland, as elsewhere, the necessary legislation for the prosecution of so-called hate speech has been in place for decades. And in cases where such has been applied, been shown to work perfectly well, the new legislation is only about surveillance, the right to pry and to punish in advance. And it goes without saying this will hardly be limited to Ireland. If the past three years have taught us anything, it's that small, well-regulated populations are used as test beds for the next bright idea from the authoritarians. I'm thinking about how Israelis, Australians and New Zealanders, for example, were made the lab rats of the most draconian steps taken during the Covid debacle. 
What is seen to empower the state in Ireland will surely spread like a virus that really does put everyone at risk. Populations in societies where state reach is already powerful, what they call strong state capacity, as in Israel, Australia and New Zealand, to name but three, may be regarded as pre-programmed to trust authority more than they ever should. I see the meek acceptance by too many of restrictions and measures that ought to put the fear of God into every freedom-loving human being is manifesting now as something akin to Stockholm Syndrome, where captives sympathise with and so take the side of their captors. Independent US journalist Whitney Webb talked this week about her recent research into the coming together, the marrying in hell of US government, big banks and intelligence agencies with plans to cope with the latest thing we're being prepped to fear, which is cyber attack. The World Economic Forum is already talking openly about and actually predicting a catastrophic cyber attack in 2024-25. This is the same lot that predicts, along with Bill Gates' World Health Organization, imminent pandemics worse than COVID. Ask yourself how it is these unelected, unaccountable bureaucrats know all this is coming and when it will arrive. Ask yourself if perhaps they know it's coming because it's they, like Santa's evil twin, who will deliver it to our doors under cover of night. Webb has pointed out, and she's hardly alone, that a catastrophic financial crash must lie in our future. Trillions upon trillions of dollars, pounds and euros of debt are suspended over all our heads and must surely collapse. How to subtract all the money from every private citizen in the world and still have all the fabulously rich left over? According to Webb, the authorities in the US and throughout the world cannot allow the blame for all the attendant harm to arrive at the doors of Wall Street and the rest of the financial institutions. They saw the global anger narrowly diverted back in 2008 when the banks were gifted hundreds of billions of taxpayers' money and have since moved heaven and earth to make sure that when it happens again, and it will happen again, banks and governments aren't left carrying the can. What better cover, what better way to shift the blame than a global cyber attack that shuts down those banks, energy grids, closes the hospitals, disables the emergency services, disables all that's been made dependent upon the internet. And if that cyber attack can be blamed on, well, let's wonder who that might be, Russia, China, North Korea, Iran, any of those will do for a scapegoat. And with the populations of the world quaking in fear in the face of chaos and shivering and hungry, what better time for centralised agencies, a cabal of banks, NGOs and compliant politicians and the rest to step in with the solutions? In the US, the Patriot Act was rushed through just 45 days after 9-11 under the guise of making us all safer in the face of terrorism. It gave the US government the right to monitor phone calls and email exchanges, collect banking and credit records, and to track the activity of Americans on the net. In Britain, the online safety bill has handed big tech the power to decide what might be misinformation, disinformation, or malinformation, being true things that the authorities don't want you to know. Big Brother Watch described it as a Frankenstein's monster of a bill that will set free expression and privacy back decades. I've quoted US President Herbert Hoover before and will again. Every collectivist revolution rides in on a Trojan horse of emergency. It was the tactic of Lenin, Hitler and Mussolini. And emergency became the justification of the subsequent steps. This technique of creating emergency is the greatest achievement that demagoguery attains. What better opportunity to explain to us how the solution depends upon making the internet a fully regulated space, safe from anonymous hackers? that the road to utopia is paved with digital IDs, that every person's access to the internet, to email, to social media, to their bank accounts, must depend on them offering up a digital ID that dispenses with their anonymity and their privacy and enables the state to monitor in real time anything and everything a person might read or publish or do online. Once the digital IDs are accepted by desperate, angry, frightened populations, what do you think the state might do next? CBDCs and social credit scores, anyone? Amazon and Microsoft are among the tech giants standing ready to unite with government, banks, intelligence agencies and entities like the United Nations, the World Economic Forum and the World Health Organization. All of that's my opinion, of course, and you're free to disagree. Joining me this, uh, this evening is uh, Tom uh, Buick, friend of the show, 
Um, Tom, what do you make of my assertion that more people should be worried about what's happening in Ireland? Mm. It's good to be back. Merry Christmas uh, to you, Neil. Um, any rush legislation, in my view, is folly. I mean, you mentioned the Patriot Act there. But just listen to your monologue. Uh, although it's been a while, uh, you know, it hasn't lost any of the potency that I've uh, come to uh, hear from you, Neil. Um, but as ever, you, you take quite a gloomy view of human nature. I think you take a slightly quasi-conspiratorial view of the technology and some of the people that might be behind it. That's not to say I don't think there are some real worries about uh, a surveillance society, whether that's the new laws, draconian laws, in my view, that have come out of the Irish Republic. Um, but we need to look at this, in my view, as a glass half full and a glass half empty. You know, there's technology in your pocket, in my pocket, on my wrist, that can monitor my health. If my daughter, not that she's, uh, I hope, listening, um, turns up a little bit late and I'm worried about her, I can track through my phone and her phone, phone where she is. In other words, you know, as Edward Snowden said, we are all of us walking around with a spy in our pocket in the surveillance society. These are technologies, though, that you are adopting for your own reasons and out of choice. What I'm, what my contention is why, when these measures are, for example, being... Uh, uh, run through the Parliament in Ireland, why aren't more people utterly aghast and up in arms that any government would seek to have the police able to demand a pin to see what you might have been looking at on your phone mm. that you might choose to circulate to somebody else? I mean, what kind of level of intrusion are people going to finally push back against? Yes. Well, we, we have the same huge intrusion. You mentioned the uh, online uh, what was the safety bill. It's now an act of Parliament. We've had previously uh, the Regulatory Investigative Powers Act in this country, which gives GCHQ and our intelligence agencies probably more sweeping powers, actually, than the intelligence agencies have in Ireland. But your point is about at what point do we push back on this surveillance society? And I think the answer to that is about how do we democratise this digital age? How do we ensure that whether it's the big tech firms, whether it's the banks, whether it's uh, elites in our governments around the world, that actually they are subject, subjected to our and democracy. Are we, are we, though, not walking, sleepwalking into a situation where we are guilty until we prove ourselves innocent? This concept of a zero-trust society hmm. where the onus is somehow on us, the law-abiding taxpayers, to demonstrate to the myrmidons of the state that we are going about our private business. Yeah. Well, look, I mean, we're both very keen students uh, of social history. You know, go right back to the Magna Carta, this idea of, you know, uh, free-born people being free from arbitrary arrest. It seems to me we've lost some of these basic liberties, these basic principles that, are, frankly, our ancestors fought for. The question that I come back to is, what is the mechanism, therefore, for democratising this digital age? How do we ensure that actually these intelligence agencies and others cannot collect huge amounts of data on us without asking for our permission? I think that's one aspect of it. But what I wouldn't want to do is to lose sight of the fact that you know, uh, with two billion people on this planet who have no access to any digital technology, bank accounts, for example, or any financial services, live on less uh, than a dollar a day, Short, I think, of us decamping here and going off to outer Mongolia and living in a yurt, I don't see what the alternative is to connecting with this new say, technology. Say no to digital IDs. That's my number one message.